one could say. If time were real, then the chronicity, this, the, the way it is occurring in time would give us an answer. What happens first could be the cause. What happens later could be the effect. If the glass of water is there first and then we are seeing it, then the material world is real. If we are seeing the glass of water, the cup of water, and then it is there, then the seeing is more real. The truth is both are simultaneous. We have no way to see a cup of water independently from the simultaneity of the two experiences. How can we know what is the truth? How can we know whether we create this entire universe or the entire universe is there just to be experienced through sensory perception by us? People have tried to oversimplify this question by saying, well, obviously the cup of water is here. If I hide it behind myself, you can't see it. So obviously it has to be there before you see it. Therefore, this is real. That's an oversimplification. Take the dream example again. Supposing you go to sleep and have a dream. In the dream you see a cup of water. And the question is, are you dreaming that there is a cup of water? Or is it really a cup of water? And somebody in the dream says, of course there is a cup of water. I can hide it there. It's gone, so it's not dreaming. And you will believe it. Where is the fallacy? The fallacy is, that other fellow who came and removed the glass was as unreal, as much part of the dream as the cup of water. We were testing one part of truth with another experience of the same nature of truth, not of a different level. Nobody came from outside of the dream to check whether the cup of water was a dream or not. In the same way, if I hide this cup of water behind me, we are testing out whether the cup of water creates this experience or the experience creates a cup of water in the same way. We are still in the same fallacy. How do we resolve this fallacy? The answer is the same as would be given. How do you know it's a dream? And you go to sleep and are having an interesting dream. How do you know it's a dream? If somebody nudges you on the side and wakes you up, that's the way to know it's a dream. And that's the best way. If somebody wakes you up in the middle of the dream, you can say, ah, I was having a great dream. Is there any other way of saying it? There is no certain way of knowing it. There are possible ways of saying, I guess this looks dreamlike. Have you ever had a dream in which you said it's a dream? Anybody have? Or I had many times. You, in the dream, you come to know it's a dream. Although you come to know it's a dream, it's very difficult to be certain of that experience till you wake up. On the other hand, when you wake up, it's impossible to have doubt about it. Supposing a person gets up in the morning and ten people try to play a joke and come around to the bed and say, you are still dreaming. The person says, no, now I'm up, up and awake. No, 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 you are still dreaming. This is here part of the dream. You can try very hard. You can bring the whole world. And they cannot fool you into believing that you are dreaming because an awareness has come of wakefulness. The awareness of wakefulness, the experience of wakefulness is totally different from a statement about dream and wakefulness. Similarly, when we have the experience of wakefulness through that art of meditation which is given by a perfect living master, through the process of love, that wakefulness gives us an awareness which is beyond doubt. It has no maybes and perhapses. It gives us the answer to how this whole universe came into being. It also gives us an answer why we adopted a particular pattern of experience while we were here. It also answers the question, what is our role here? So to get answers to these fundamental questions, it is necessary to have real meditation of going within one's own conscious self. And that is facilitated by the presence of these real mystics and masters who already experienced this. 
let us get ready and they will appear. Check it out. I have said many times to people, they said, we don't believe it. I said, all right, check it out. Be ready. See if the master appears or not. Nobody's come to me and told me I was wrong. Either the master appeared or they went away somewhere else. Nobody came back. But the point is, this experience of having contact with a spiritual master, a perfect living master, an adept who can give us knowledge of our own self without putting us into any cult, philosophy, religion, do's and don'ts, outside manuals, taking us into all external forms of rituals and ceremonies. This is possible only by having contact with such a being who does not teach us to follow something else, but tells us, go within and find the truth. These are the mystics and masters about whom I speak and I want to share with you. Are any one of you coming to the workshop tomorrow? We will experiment with the actual state of being when we are with ourselves within. We are going to experiment what it is to be behind the eyes. And what happens when we are touched by love with the spiritual master? It's an experience, experiential workshop. It's not merely an extension of a lecture. Therefore, I welcome you and I thank you for your patience in listening to me. And I was in an impromptu way sharing with you my own experiences with mystics and masters. Thank you very much. There are some questions that I would like to answer. Yes. What I don't know is, well, what I cannot reconcile is, it seems that uh, when there is no effort and the attention is withdrawn, then uh, this is not my experience. This is not my experience. And at this moment, I become very humble and realize my ordinary I'm not a special person anymore. But then, how is it possible? Isn't that still duality to have like one side I think I talk in the evening right now, you know, I am everything I see. On the other side I talk from the other way. Do you know anybody or do you know yourself that can go beyond that? It's a very good question. When the seven students, which is actually something much beyond me, I'm not there. But then when I'm there, this other experience is gone. Is there a way to reconcile me? Thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> the question is a very good one. And uh, it might have been the experience of many others in this audience that when we have an experience of trying to do something and live with our ego, we have a certain personality that does it. And then when we want to be totally egoless, to efface this mind, we go into a state of humility which is totally different. These two seem to be our different personalities. One comes and the other goes. The other comes and this one goes. Is there a way to reconcile the two? Or do we have to live up with this? That there are two things. One has to do this work with ego in this world. And one has to seek the spirituality through an effortless method that takes this ego away and make us humble and in a universal state, not separated. Are these two beings within the self separate? Can we reconcile them? Is that the question? Okay, this must... Anybody else thinks this is a good question? Okay, you are not... I think I sometimes been reluctant to go further in the direction of sensing, partly because if I did go further um, and lost the ego, then somehow I would not be able to experience what's happening. And I think she has said, partly because I, the, the ego or the old me, isn't there anymore. So I think a separate part of the question, um, either mine or hers, I'm not sure, but a, a, a second part of the question is, is the problem not only how to reconcile it, but 
but how to actually have it or experiencing it as opposed to not having it because the, the old you isn't there anymore. Very good. Second part of the question is, is the risk worth taking? <laughs> What good is it going into universality? I tell you, as, as a child, when I was growing up and found a master, and I found a lot of people on the spiritual path talking of the spiritual journey, like the journey of a drop of water separated from the ocean. Have you ever heard that description? That we are drops of the ocean separated from the ocean, and the spiritual journey is to go back and merge with it. When I heard that, I was very upset, like my friends here. I was upset. At least I am a drop of water now. <laughs> what will I get by merging? The ocean won't get anything by one drop more. Neither ocean will gain, nor I will gain. I lose everything I have. What kind of spiritual journey is this? At least I have my personality. I have my ego, I am seeing a drama, I am seeing a show, I go and get merged with the universality of consciousness, which is already universal and full, and I lose everything. What good is that? I, I had those fears, very similar to yours. I did not want to let go of something already here for the strange sounding experience of a universality in which my individuality goes. It's terrible. This comes, this uh, question arises from our thinking that there is a separation between what we are now and what we may be on the other side. Supposing there is no separation, then the question doesn't arise. For example, supposing the drop never left the ocean. In fact, the answer came to me to my question of drop and ocean in a totally different way. It came from the fact that the ocean, which is God, creator, totality, that the ocean is perfect. That means it is full. And I realized if one drop has escaped from it, it is no longer a full ocean. The, the answer came from another side. That if the ocean is always full and total and no drop ever left, and then I am asking this question, what will happen to me as a drop that is away from the ocean to go back into an ocean from where no drop ever left? So the answer came from somewhere else. The answer was, the drop never left the ocean. It was a delusion, a dream. And who was the dreamer? The ocean, not the drop. Because the drop was a dream. Because no drop ever left the ocean. If the drop had really left the ocean, then the ocean was not worthwhile going back to. If, if our totality, if the creator, if our higher self, if our own real self or the creator within is perfect and full and nothing has ever left it, we have no danger because it's always full, it's still full. If that totality is full and conscious, then this experience of individuated consciousness, which we call ego, is a dream of that full consciousness. Therefore, waking up into our real state could never lead to any loss. We could only lose if we have something outside of that state. All right, let us consider, then we have a nice dream. How many dreamers are there in it? Have you ever thought of it? Supposing you have a dream and thousands of people are there assembled. How many people out of those thousands are dreaming for that dream? Only one. Do you ever find it necessary that two people should dream to go and meet in the dream? Only one dream and both meet there. The dreamer is one. Who is the other person? Part of the dream. What role does the dreamer play in the dream? Supposing... I have a dream. In the dream, I become a bird and fly. Or I become a spirit and function like a spirit. Or I become the totality of consciousness and function like that. Or I become a little ant and crawl. 
or I become a human being and look at all this and comment upon it. Do you notice that in all these forms that I may take in my dream, I continue to be the self in the dream. And all other forms become others. It never happens that I am the self in the dream and another person in the dream is dreaming that dream. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever had such a dream in which you were the self and somebody else was dreaming and somebody else woke up? It never happened. Not reality. When consciousness goes through the process of illusion of individuation and creates the experience of ego and a separateness and individuality, that illusion is dispelled by spiritual knowledge and you find your own true self, not somebody else. So there are no two personalities. These look like two personalities from this end. When we are in this end, we are looking for something else. We say, how can we give up what we have for something else that we are finding? That something else is the same. It's not different. It's the same in real form. Therefore, purely theoretically, the answer will be that there is only one consciousness. There never was two. There never have been two. There is the experience of more than one consciousnesses which creates this feeling of duality, division, manyness. There is only one. The whole show of creation is taking place within one consciousness. And all the rest are part of the show. When you wake up or go to higher and higher levels of wakefulness, you get back to more and more of that oneness. But that oneness is not separate from you. It's the same oneness. Now, what is it that makes us feel separate? Why should we feel separate from our own oneness? It's the same mind that needs the time space and distance and we may reflect to be separate from experience. Once you are separated from experience, then you feel you have very little and you can lose something. This feeling of losing something comes when we rely on mind and separate ourselves. Ego is a negative ego when it separates you from others. It's a positive ego if it takes on others within itself. Let me give an example. A person who says, it's wonderful, God gave me this beautiful life. God gave me this beautiful world. God gave me so many people and so many homes and so many continents and so much earth and so many planets. Wow, I got a huge universe. That's also ego. It's very positive. You can never be unhappy with it. But when you start saying, that's not my house, this is my house. That's somebody else's car, a bigger car than mine. That's a bigger house than mine. That's, he has more money than I have. I don't have it. When you separate yourself with the same ego, and everybody else gets more and more and more, and you are left with little and little and little, you get into problem. It's the same ego. But this individuation, the feeling of individuation, is a state in the devolution of this illusion called experience. If you rise in meditation to greater and greater awareness of your own self, you will find you are always the central piece. You are always the king player. You are the key. You never go and exchange yourself for anything else. You get more and more. There is nobody else coming in to share with you. You are getting more and more because you are getting more and more knowledge of how the whole thing happened. You are discovering what looked separate and different was your own self. You discover eventually the whole creation was nothing but your own self. And all the people were nothing but an illusion of your own self. But this rise takes stage by stage. For example, right now the physical body which we take as our self divides us from other, all other selves. If the physical body that is making us say, this is mine, this is not mine. If I have my jacket, I say it's my jacket. I don't say it's my body's jacket. In fact, if my 
if his son were to come and stand here, I say, ladies and gentlemen, meet my son. Not a correct statement for a person who has spiritual awareness. The correct statement would be, ladies and gentlemen, meet my body's son. Because all we are one. But at this level of separation, when we are in the physical world, we use this physical body as a unit which separates us from everything else. And therefore, we look at what belongs to this physical body alone as belonging to us. And everything else is separated. And we have to seek it. But when we go on to a state where physical separation doesn't come into play, at the level of sensory perceptions only, not physical separation, we find that a lot of these things which we thought were separate were actually combined. When we rise to a universal mental level, I'll explain to you tomorrow, for those who are coming to the workshop, how this physical, sensory, mental and spiritual level, they create illusions one after the other, separating us more and more from one another, creating many more than they really are. But as we go backwards or back to the original state of consciousness in which we are, we discover that the many were created because of the illusion, level of illusion. You remove one level of illusion, so many things come, come back, collapse into your own self. You remove the second level, you again collapse. The last level to go is at the spiritual level and is called the illusion of individuation. That we are individuated and separated self is illusion. And then we discover that the totality was our own real substance, our own real nature, our own reality. At that level, everything becomes clear. It also becomes clear why we had to go into series of illusions. So this uh, fear is unfounded and is based upon the illusion of this reality. If this is real, then the fear is real. If this is illusion and what we are striving for through the spiritual path is more real, we will not lose anything. If I forget my wallet in my dream, I am not poor. Any other question? Yes. You mentioned that when the student is ready, it will appear. But um, there is no way that a person can be ready because if the effort is extra from less, if it's so tiring, then once the term is ready, it can be ready or not ready. The pattern of experience itself has a point of readiness in it. Now that's a way of explaining why are we having a certain pattern of experience? Being born, growing up in a certain way in a family, rich or poor, sick or healthy, we are having several incidents and accidents in our life. Why are all these things happening? They are happening according to a pre-programmed destiny or life pattern. The state of readiness is fixed as one of the points on that pattern. That if it is already fixed, why am I making so much about it? That we have to be ready? Because our minds are making so much about it. That we can do something about it. Therefore, the point of readiness is already there. It's fixed on this evolution, according to karma. Karma is an explanation for why we are having a certain pattern. We are having this pattern of life because of previous patterns through which we have come. And those patterns are generating new patterns of existence. And karma is merely an explanation for moving from one pattern of existence to another. So it's already been set. So there is really nothing you can do about it. So, so people who are aware of this, just wait for that moment. People who are not aware of it, try very hard and still come to the same moment. People who are still not aware of this thing, worry very hard, argue, discuss and come to the same moment. So the point of readiness is based upon our karma and experiences already afloat. <clears throat> but the human mind doesn't accept it. The human mind and the human ego through which this knowledge and awareness is seeping through at this level doesn't accept that. It will be fatalism and human mind wants to discredit it. It is not doing our best. 
is fatalism. We are not, uh, we are not trying to do anything, nothing will happen. So we have been trained and brought up into the use and application of this mechanics of the human mind, which makes it an appropriate language to say when you are ready, the teacher appears. Yes? I don't think you have anything to offer with respect to a thing that I've been working with theoretically and experimentally of the hierarchical code vestige duality. Uh, that is to say that uh, many, of, many of us, I'm sure, live almost totally in one conscious domain. Um, and we've got a subconscious running around with which we hardly ever communicate formally, and a superconscious that's almost entirely untouched. Now, I'm using the analogy here that you use, if you approach an, an island of a completely different population, you don't know their speech, their habits, but if you uh, uh, indicate friendliness to them, go with pigeon English, and then uh, exchange coconuts for beads, um, you discover that you begin to have uh, a, a symbiotic communication between these and can begin to run parallel. Now, I've been doing this very painfully um, and eventually just barely getting beyond access to the superconscious and the shared consciousness. Now, I wonder, you must have very rapid, easily learned techniques for doing this, but I've been laboring for several years to get some skill. That's what the master teach us, that we should have very easy access to all these regions. And it should be so easy, we should move between different experiences and levels as easily as you like to rest on a couch for an afternoon or say I want to have a little repast. Just like that, you should be able to move from all these levels. And once you have uh, practiced this effortlessly and gone to that uh, side, you'll find it's extremely easy to move between these. And they accept the coconuts and beads very quickly. <laughs> but when you start from this end, it's very difficult. This is one of those strange things that it's very difficult from this end and very easy from the other end. So, if you make it, then you wonder why you didn't do it so easily before. Because it's nothing outside. There is no effort involved. There is no big weight to carry. There are no gags to carry. There is nothing, no travel to be done. It's so easy. People say, how far do we have to travel to go to the spiritual destination? The answer is, don't travel. If you travel, you don't go. This is stop traveling. See, because our mind is constantly in motion. We have to make this mind motionless. Be here. All the answers, all those regions are here. Now, within ourselves, once we have facility of experiencing them, then it's as easy as blinking your eyes. And one can have a multi-level, multi-regional experiences at all times. It's beautiful. You, you can, you know that part. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. How do we break down our resistance to go beyond the individuality? It's my experience is that in many ways we think people very desire things. We build up the individuality, we build up the sense of what are ourselves. And then that counteracts this, this um, effort or effortlessness, you may say, to become one. I mean, there's this resistance. It's like, no, you don't want to do that. I'm sitting here, he's sitting there, and, you know, the oneness just is out there somewhere. And then there's resistance to experience that. What breaks that down? Going there breaks it down easily. But you, can, you can't break it down sitting here. If you try to plan ahead, now I want to break down this duality. Before I go there, you never do it. It's like that guy who fell into the river, into the well. There was a well in India. And some guy walking, must be an absent-minded professor or somebody, he fell into the well. And he groaned and he shouted. He says, I've been trapped. I can't come out. And hearing his groans, a man walking outside, he came and he said, Oh, you are trapped inside. How did you fall? Come, I'll lower a rope. I've got a rope with me. So he lowered the rope to the professor who was in the well. 
And the professor says, before I catch the rope and come out, first explain to me how I dropped in. Then tell me, how, I, how can I be sure I won't fall in again? And then tell me, how did you bring the rope? How do, do I get? He said, if you want to discuss all these things, first come out, we'll walk along and discuss. He said, no, I won't hold the rope till you first explain this to me. Sometimes uh, the intellectual efforts to get all the answers before we start make us stay there. So the answers are actually at the other end. And the answers are in a different form than we expect. They are in a very different form. For example, uh, the, this uh, question, which people repeat all the time, in so many conferences I have uh, find uh, people speaking of oneness. We have oneness. Now, I, I watch them carefully. That what do they mean when they say, we are all one? They are trying to bring a concept from truth. Truth is we are one. But what they are trying to bring at the physical level is there is something in us in our consciousness that holds us together. That is not what is the answer. The answer is not that we are not one. You can keep on saying we are one, we are not one. Go out and see them fighting, the same people. So what makes them one is to wake up and find that only one created everything. That one alone created all that we saw and experienced. And that one which created all was being experienced by us at that time of the manyness in the physical body within the self. That answer we can't understand here. That answer becomes meaningful and becomes a real answer when we wake up and discover how the many were created. Therefore, whether you like it or not, all the answers cannot be had in advance on the spiritual path. On the spiritual path, you can have answers according to the assumptions of reality that we are making here. And as we rise to higher reality and higher knowledge, the answers come automatically and they brush away the earlier assumed answers that we were working on. But these masters, very clever people, I must tell you this. You may hit into them if you are seeker. They are very clever people because they understand that we are stuck at a certain point and have to rise from there. Therefore, they go along with us. Let me go back to the analogy of uh, waking up while sleeping. I said the best way to wake up, to discover we are dreaming is for a wake, awakened person to nudge us in the sight and say, get up. Now, supposing I am having a nice dream that I am eating the old Shakey's pizza. One of my old favorites. And I say, what wonderful pizza I'm having. I'm enjoying myself. But that's a dream. In the dream, I'm eating pizza. And the awakened person knows I'm just sleeping. There is no pizza there. He comes and nudges me. Says, get up. Get up. And I say, let me finish it. And he says, finish it quickly. And I'll hold the rest for you and wake up. And then I wake up. Do I get hold of him and say, where is my pizza? You promised to hold it? No. His purpose of making that statement, yes, all the rest of it was to participate in my dream sequence, where by his statement it became easier for me. Therefore, awakened the Matai regional level, all the different levels of consciousness in which we can have experiences, they come and participate in our life at our level, and they tell us things which are appropriate at our level. We find that they are saying those things and making them real for us because that's the only reality we know. And with that reality, they wake us up to a higher sense. And then we don't ask those questions because we know they were only meant for that particular stage. So the answers will come a lot more as we go along. Yes. If you have a hologram photograph of a beautiful picture of a garden full of flowers, the photograph smash it into a million individual pieces. Each small piece could have filled the whole garden. However, you use it, you lose a lot of the beauty and detail. And you only can get that beauty and detail back again if you reassemble all the pieces. So each piece plays a very important role, but each piece is the whole by itself as well. That's true. Good analogy, very good. Thank you. 
Any other comment or question? Yes. I'm thinking about time as opposed to effortlessness. And I get the sense like, is it just that you just kind of sit back and watch and then go all along for the ride and wherever things are supposed to happen, it's going to happen and you don't need to make any effort? Or I'm just you know, I'm just thinking about that. Like, uh, uh, when we talk of effort, we are talking of the mind. The mind says, I have to do it. Suppose the mind says, now I am going to do effortless things. I won't do anything. Is doing as much as doing something. Therefore, the mind saying, I am going to be passive and wait here. It will happen. As going out to do something. Therefore, when I talk of effortlessness, I am not talking of passivity or inaction. Effortlessness is to be in tune. Actually what they say is to be in tune with the will. Have you heard of this living in the will of the Lord, the will of the Creator? Ever heard of it? Isn't His will prevailing all the time? And what is the meaning of the statement, try and live in the will of the Lord? The meaning is exactly the same. That the will of the Lord is prevailing, but we don't know it. We try to clash with it in awareness. We try to use our mind and say, maybe this part I can do, the rest Lord will do. So how do we start living in the will of the Lord? By being in tune with all that is happening around us and living in the will. One, I frequently quote that mystic, uh, Middle Eastern mystic, Marana Rum. Rumi, he has written some nice poetry. He said, people ask me, what is the will of the Lord? And I tell them, when he has given you a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will, dig. Now, if he has given you a spade in your hand, and you say, I am living in his will, so I will hold the spade here. That's not living in his will. Why did he give you the spade? So, to live in the circumstances and conditions as existing around us is living in the will of the Lord. And that is the meaning of the effortless meditation. And not that we take a passive attitude and say, we will not act. Because the decision of the mind to not act or to act is the same both ways. So live in the will of the Lord. That means whatever indications are coming to you from circumstances and coincidences around you, live in those. And you will be living in the will of the Lord. And that will help in the effortless meditation. It was very nice to meet all of you and uh, I uh, hope uh, I'll be seeing many of you tomorrow on an experiential and experimental workshop. Thank you very much. Good night.